Living longer. Living healthier. Living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, can be sneaky. The disease is often not discovered until it's advanced, making treatment more difficult. That's why it's important to know the early warning signs. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life, a show dedicated to helping you do just that. I'm your host, Lisa Sather. Today we'll learn about COPD and being on the lookout for breathing problems that are not just part of getting older. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 16 million Americans have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and experts think millions more have it and don't know it. Joining us this morning to talk to us about COPD is Becky Wozniak. Thanks for being here, Becky. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So people may not realize that COPD is an umbrella disease. So can you talk to us about what that means and what COPD is? Yes. <clears throat> so we call it an umbrella disease um, because it's not just one condition. It encompasses a few conditions, and the two most common are emphysema and chronic bronchitis. And these are um, diseases that make it harder for people to breathe and get oxygen in and out. So can you talk to us about what happens to a person's lungs actually physiologically when he or she develops COPD? Absolutely. So um, emphysema specifically is a disease where the air sacs in the lungs are damaged and they actually um, get larger and they can burst open. This traps air so it makes it hard when you're breathing it's hard to take in fresh air because there's all this air trapped in your lungs, so it makes people very short of breath. And in the case of chronic bronchitis, there's a lot of inflammation in the lung tissue, and um, this inflammation makes the airways smaller and makes it much harder to get air in and out. How serious is COPD? In fact, can it even be fatal? It definitely can be fatal. This is a very serious condition um, and it is progressive. So if it's not treated appropriately, it can certainly be fatal. And it's in fact one of the more, um, one of the biggest causes of death in the United States. So I understand statistics show that women die more often than men from COPD. Do we know why that is? Um, not specifically, but we have some thoughts on that. Um, a lot of women in the 1960s were very targeted by cigarette and tobacco companies um, to get into smoking. And now we see those young women are now um, more elderly and the effects of that smoking is starting to um, show in the form of COPD. We also know that women have smaller lungs generally, and estrogen might play a role in making COPD worse for women. And I also see a lot of women in my practice who maybe downplay their symptoms and don't tell their doctors how serious their symptoms are, and so we don't find it until it's further along. So do we think that smoking is maybe one of the major causes of COPD then? Definitely, but it's not the only cause. Um, smoking is definitely um, one of the more, um, more known causes of COPD, but any sort of chemical exposure, dusts, um, various uh, pesticides and other sorts of um, lung irritants can cause COPD as well. And not everyone gets COPD from an exposure. Some people can have a genetic condition. It's an alpha-1 deficiency. And an alpha-1 deficiency um, just means that your body doesn't produce a certain protein that can protect your lungs, which can lead to symptoms similar to COPD. So COPD doesn't just affect people's lungs. I know it can lead to other complications. Can you talk about those? Sure. Um, COPD makes it hard to breathe, which that, if you can't breathe well, it's going to decrease your physical activity. Some people find that they're unable to work, which can lead to things like anxiety and depression. They aren't able to um, do the things they want to do, so it leads to a lot of social isolation. And we know that COPD is usually um, attributed to several other chronic conditions like heart failure, um, diabetes, asthma, things like that. So we talked about women being more susceptible to COPD than men. Are there any other groups of people that are also um, more likely to be diagnosed with COPD? Sure, um, anyone over the age of 65, um, 
For some reason, we know that American Indians and Alaskans tend to be more prone to COPD. Um, we also know that people who live in rural areas of the country tend to also be more prone to COPD. So what is that about living in rural areas that affects um, the, the more likely nature of getting COPD there? A lot of people in rural areas um, generally um, work on their own. They work on ranches or farms. They don't have health insurance. It's also difficult for them to travel. They have to travel much further to get health care. Um, and we also know that they're just very hardworking individuals. They are working on their ranches. There's always something new to do. They don't want to take the time out for self-care um, until their symptoms are so bad that they can't do those things. And at that point, it's, it's pretty late in the game. Um, and we also just know that people who live in rural areas tend to smoke more. They just don't have the, um, the resources for smoking cessation that some people in urban areas have. That's interesting. So we've talked about how COPD can be fatal. Does it have to be fatal or, are there, or how, what do we do about that? It doesn't always have to be fatal. Um, it is a progressive disease. And so if we can initiate treatment earlier in the disease, we can um, kind of slow that progression down and people can live very productive lives with COPD as long as it's managed with their doctors. So we have about a minute left in this segment, Becky. Is there anything else you'd like to give as a parting thought before we take a quick break? Um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to your doctor when you are feeling short of breath and feeling like COPD might be something that you're struggling with. There are treatments available and we can, we can help with that. There's an awful lot of commercials on TV that talk to this too as well. So we're seeing that and I think the awareness is really becoming more obvious to folks. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. I want to thank you very much for the information that you've shared so far. So thank you. if you'll stay with us, we'll be back in a few minutes. Okay. Next, COPD often goes undiagnosed because people don't recognize the symptoms. We'll talk about the warning signs you need to know so COPD can be caught early and how COPD is diagnosed. Stay with us. Welcome back. Many people with COP don't recognize the symptoms and wait before seeing a doctor. This makes treating COPD more difficult and increases people's risk from dying from COPD. Becky Wozniak is still here. Thanks for staying with us, Becky. Thank you. Let's talk about common COPD symptoms for a little bit. Can you enlighten our viewers on what that looks like? Absolutely. One of the biggest um, symptoms that people com complain of is a chronic cough. And chronic just means that that cough has lasted for weeks or even months and just doesn't go away. Oftentimes that cough can be associated with um, sputum or phlegm that you're coughing up. Um, it's also shortness of breath, feeling just like you can't catch your breath, doing the regular activities that you normally do and just finding that you can't do them as you, as you could before. Um, you may notice that your lips start to look a little bit blue or even your fingernail buds start to look a little bit blue. That's also a sign of COPD. Those sound like very, uh, very serious symptoms to me. Why do you think people put off seeking help? You know, a lot of people um, don't actually recognize it as COPD. They, a lot of people think that it's just aging, that they're just getting short of breath or that they're just out of shape. Um, so they don't recognize it for what it is. And as we mentioned earlier, a lot of people downplay their symptoms and they almost feel embarrassed, especially if, you know, at long time smokers, they know that smoking leads to lung d disease and they sometimes feel as though it's their own fault and they, they're embarrassed to seek help. So we know that people experiencing these symptoms should go see their doctor. So how do, how do you as a provider know, or anyone for that matter know, if it's COPD or asthma? How do you differentiate those symptoms? Well, I talk a lot with my patients. I want to talk to them about their symptoms, how long they've had their symptoms, um, what exactly their symptoms are. I want to get a good history on maybe what exposures they've had. Um, and then we can do a few tests to check for COPD. 
um, one of the first tests that we're going to do is what's called spirometry. And this is where the patient blows into a big machine and we can measure how much air they're getting in their lungs, how much air they're blowing out of their lungs, and how quickly they're able to do that. That gives us a good idea as to whether this is COPD or asthma or another condition. So briefly earlier you mentioned chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So um, can you talk a little bit more about each of these and the symptoms of the two? Sure. Um, so like I said, emphysema is when the lung sacs, the little air sacs that are deep in your lungs, they tend to get larger and they actually break and they can cause air trapping. So this makes it very hard for patients to take in a big breath. They can't get new fresh air in because air is trapped in the bottoms of their lungs. So these patients do feel um, quite short of breath pretty frequently. Whereas chronic bronchitis um, is very similar to asthma. These patients might notice a, a wheeze or a whistle when they're breathing, and they just have a very difficult time getting air out and in as those air, um, airways are inflamed and restricted. So how does somebody know the difference between chronic bronchitis and acute bronchitis? What's the difference? Sure. So acute bronchitis, this is something almost always associated with a cold, and it lasts you know, for a few days or even a week or two. You go to the doctor, oftentimes you get antibiotics, um, and this goes away. It goes away very quickly, whereas chronic bronchitis lasts for months or even years. Can people get emphysema and chronic bronchitis at the same time? Yes. In fact, most people with COPD do have both, um, which makes COPD such a difficult disease um, because it's, it's a lot of lung issues and that's why it's very hard to breathe. So if someone gets diagnosed with COPD, um, and then what's next? What are the treatment options? So um, there's a variety of treatments depending on their symptoms. We may want to consider something such as pulmonary rehab, we can also, there's a variety of medications that we can use um, to treat COPD. Great, so we're gonna talk more about treatment options here in a few minutes, um, but is treatment determined by how severe COPD is or how does a patient know which treatment option is right for them? Yeah, so it's important to speak to your doctor and be very honest about your symptoms. And it's important not to downplay those symptoms because COPD is progressive. We want to um, slow that progression down and the treatments are based on how severe the symptoms are. And so it's important to get on the right medication is letting your doctor know what exactly you're experiencing. And that will help your doctor choose the right treatment for you. That makes total sense. So uh, can you talk about the stages of COPD? Are there stages? There are stages. Yeah. Um, the first stage oftentimes is, is very, patients don't really notice they have it. They might just have that chronic cough that we spoke about or very mild shortness of breath. These patients can, can function very normally and live their lives and a lot of patients don't know at this point that they have COPD. And that can progress much further to the point where patients are very debilitated on oxygen and some even have tracheostomies or other ventilators and things to help them breathe. So one last question before we have to take a quick break and that is, can COPD be cured? It cannot be cured, but it can be managed. So the lung damage that happens from COPD is permanent. We can't fix it, but we can slow that progression, like I said, and we can manage it so that it doesn't get to the point of um, being fatal. Awesome, excellent. Well, thank you for that information. We're gonna take a quick break and so I hope you'll stay with us. Yeah, thanks. We need to pause here for a quick break. After the break, we'll dig deeper into treatment options and how to live with COPD. Please don't go away. Thanks for staying with us. There are different treatment options for someone who's been diagnosed with COPD. It's important for people with COPD to talk with their doctor about treatment options to make sure they find one that's right for them and succeeds in helping them breathe better. Becky Wozniak is still with us. Welcome back again, Becky. Thank you. So earlier uh, in the show, we talked about treatment options before the break, and um, I'd like to get into some of those a little, little bit more. Mm -hmm. So first, if a doctor recommends pulmonary rehabilitation, what can a person expect? Sure. Well, 
what they can expect to begin with is a full assessment. And this is going to be by a team of healthcare providers. And your team is going to include probably your family practice provider, um, a specialist such as a pulmonologist, which is a lung doctor. There's probably going to be um, respiratory therapists and even physical therapists to help with pulmonary rehab. Um, we also can, um, there's going to be some testing because we want to reach patients where they are and we don't want to, that's going to make their um, process easier for them. Um, and we also um, will do something called a six minute walk test. And this is where we're going to have patients walk for six minutes. We're going to be testing their oxygen and their heart rate um, through that test so we can just see where their lung function is now and then we can make goals for where we need to go. All right, so a lot of assessment, then a plan is made. So can you talk some more about what exactly then happens during the actual pulmonary rehabilitation process? Absolutely. So patients are going to get a lot of education in pulmonary rehabilitation. They're going to learn various breathing exercises. When you are short of breath, um, it can be very easy to let that breath get out of control, and then patients have very severe symptoms. And so we teach patients various breathing techniques, such as pursed lip breathing, um, breathing through pursed lips, almost like blowing up candles on a birthday cake, and taking slow, deep breaths in through their nose. Um, this can help slow down their breathing and get regain control of that breath when they start to feel a little bit out of control. So they'll learn breathing techniques. They're also just gonna get more education on what COPD is and how to prevent it from progressing. Um, and one of those big education points is lifestyle modification. And so if they currently are smoking, we're gonna give them a lot of education and a lot of support to help them quit smoking. We're also gonna do some nutritional counseling. We know that patients with COPD, um, we want them to maximize their nutrition and eat some healthier foods that might help decrease inflammation in their body. We also want them to get plenty of protein um, just so that their nutritional status, their bodies themselves can help heal themselves. Um, and we also know that when it's hard to breathe, it can sometimes be hard to eat. So we wanna make sure that we can maximize nutrition with what they're able to intake. How long was, uh, would somebody with COPD continue with pulmonary rehabilitation then? That's different for each patient. Um, it's, most programs can be you know, several weeks long, and then we stop and reassess. We reassess how, um, how far they've come in pulmonary rehab and if there's things that we still need to work on. So that's a very individualized process. Would you say that uh, pulmonary rehabilitation is the most effective treatment for COPD? It can be, but it's not, um, not alone. All that education and lifestyle modification is very important, but we put that in conjunction with various medications that can help. So let's talk about some other treatment options. Uh, when do doctors usually recommend oxygen therapy, and what does oxygen therapy involve? Well, when your oxygen gets too low, um, it can cause a, a variety of issues. And so doctors are gonna want to monitor your oxygen each time you come in for an appointment. And when you start to discover that you can't walk from the parking lot into the doctor's office, or you can't do the things you wanna do without your oxygen getting quite low, the doctor will talk to you about oxygen therapy. Not all patients need oxygen all the time though. Some patients only need oxygen when they're doing certain activities or some only need it when they're sleeping. And so oxygen therapy will be very individualized based on the patient's symptoms. Are there pros and cons to using oxygen therapy? Absolutely. Patients do find that when they have supplemental oxygen when they need it, it can be life changing because all of a sudden they have something to help with that shortness of breath. When they're better oxygenated, they can think more clearly and um, their heart rate is slower, so they feel better on oxygen. However, the cons is that some patients really feel um, embarrassed mm -hmm. to go out in public with their oxygen, or if they don't have a portable oxygen tank, they feel very tethered to their homes mm -hmm. and they, it causes some social isolation. Let's talk about medications, prescription medications. Obviously, those are available to treat COPD. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. 
So there are a variety of medications that we're going to use to treat COPD and it's very individualized based on your symptoms. Some of the most common are various inhalers and these inhalers that to start with we talk about bronchodilators and a bronchodilator is um, a medication that's going to help relax those airways and make them a little bit more open so air can come in and out easier. And people are familiar with these medications. Um, you may have heard of albuterol, um, a pro-air, or a Ventolin inhaler. Great. There's also long-acting bronchodilators, um, and those are um, more like Spiriva, and some of those longer-acting ones, those are inhalers that you take just once a day, um, and instead of the short-acting ones that you take just as needed for symptoms. We also have um, inhalers that have steroids in them, and those steroids also provide some long-acting anti-inflammatory properties that can help improve lung function. And some patients actually have to take oral steroids as well, and that means in a pill form. That was a great overview. Is surgery ever an option for patients? It can be, certainly. Um, we can do some treatments, such as um, lung capacity surgery, where we can remove part of the lung. In emphysema, when those air sacs are so large and we're trapping air, we can remove that part of the lung that's diseased and give more room for healthy lung to be there. Um, it's not a terribly common surgery, but it is an option. Um, and another option is lung transplant, but that takes some very specific criteria. Um, patients can't be still smoking, um, and there's a lot of testing involved to make sure that they're healthy enough to accept a new lung and healthy enough to keep that lung. Becky, thank you so much. That was great information you shared with us today. Mm -hmm. And thank you for watching. Come back again next week. Until then, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health in partnership with AARP Montana. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the Healthy Living for Life logo. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.